MechWarrior 5 is a game I would love to be able to recommend to all of you watching and listening right now. I wish I could say that the game smashes it out of the park, expands the series in all the right ways, and really justifies that number 5 after the title. Sadly, it does not. And it isn't because it's a broken or unplayable mess, riddled with bugs and crashes, no. The reason it doesn't work is because it just doesn't do that much to keep you interested. Now, as an opener, yeah, that sounds terrible, but honestly, there is some good in there. there. There really is. The game has really brought the battle mech to life visually with the jump to the new engine, Unreal 4. Well, it's as best as it could be expected when you compare it to the previous engine they used for MechWarrior Online. Look, it, it isn't bad looking, but the game isn't exactly current gen standard, especially for such a robust engine as UE4. Or... Visuals aren't the be-all and end-all for me. It's a deciding factor for some compared to other titles, but it just won't make the cut when it's compared, okay? Anyway, the animation works nice. The little changes, the way the mechs run and animate in general, they highlight how these behemoths you know, stride the battlefield, javelins swinging their arms left and right as they run, while the bigger mechs feel weighty and powerful. And it's nice to see the mechs that don't have weapons in their arms not actually hold them upright at a 90 degree angle, they have them lowered down, it just looks a bit better. The building destruction in game is as satisfying a visual as you and your lance crash amid small industrial complexes and civilian centres, buildings being destroyed left and right, stray fire creating holes in walls, and by the end of a fight you can step back and really take in the handiwork. Though, I just say, the way some of the buildings fall apart can be a bit jarring, going from a perfectly intact structure to uh, a nice neat 50% destroyed or a quarter of it destroyed and they just kind of vanish into these pre-destroyed chunks until the whole thing's gone. Larger buildings avoid this at least, where they have some of the outer sections just kind of crumbling apart and you can see the internals, but the smaller buildings definitely, it's a bit jarring when that happens. And it can look a bit weird. Also, it does become a bit of a mini-game of spot the asset, as MWO's assets for a lot of their buildings get reused here, and uh, recycling is definitely something PGI have done. Uh, even uh, my Law Warrior thumbnail, for those of you who watch those, you'll notice that that image, with obviously without the text on, that that's the one and only loading screen in the whole game. And also, do you want to have a look at the mechs? Because all of the image thumbnails for the mechs there are the ones from the store page in MechWarrior Online. No joke. So some of them are the green colour and then others are in camo schemes from the store page. It, it's odd. Anyway, MechWarrior 5 uses a procedural generation system to create its maps for you to navigate and do your contracts in. And they use a few different biomes, the temperate, snowy, desert, volcanic, and it sort of randomly adds the objectives for those into the map. So you don't see the same kind of map over and over again in the way it's laid out. Something that probably HBS Battletech could have done with addressing at some point. However, the list does need to increase of the number of biomes. I mean, where are the airless moons, or alien biomes like large fungal forests, or massive urban sprawls to fight around? Perhaps they'll arrive at a later update, just not now. Some of the terrain features, though, can be regularly seen. I do remember seeing in the desert area a large dry riverbed being reused several times over, so I'm not sure if some parts are handcrafted assets that get randomly placed, or if the whole thing is just a coincidence there. Though my favourite feature of the whole game is the star map, the entire inner sphere laid out before you with every single system plotted. The thing would be an amazing start point for an interactive map or encyclopedia for the Battletech universe. Being able to select every system, read about them, show you details like manufacturing plants, famous battles and events that took place there, units that are stationed, that kind of thing. It looks great. My only gripe with this is that the periphery isn't really marked on there. The systems are all there, and you can even visit them if you want, but there's no conflict zones or missions to take. And they don't even show you the territory of any of them, so if you do visit the Outworlds Alliance, you can't see their logo or their territory marked on the map. Though, as you progress through the timeline of the game, major events will take place, like the War of 3039 or the uh, Free Razalhag Republic coming into existence. But the timeline does end at 3049, just shy of the year when the clans arrived. No doubt these will be some kind of paid DLC though in the coming months. Uh, they've also been pretty smart with how missions are handled. There are numerous conflict zones dotted around the Innisfere map, marking areas like civil conflicts or corporations handling a workers uprising to full-blown border war zones like the kind you'd find between like Lau and Marik or Davian and Curita. 
and within these zones that's where the missions are generated and from those missions you gain reputation both for your merc company and with the faction and you earn sea bills for completing the missions in those locations but the industrial zones allow you to buy equipment and these are also bought at lower prices than you buy in the conflict zones it's also where you can get new pilots and repairs are cheaper for your mechs as there's an abundance of techs and spare parts available these are also where you find some of the best mechs in the sector, sometimes the hero mechs from MWO being available, or rare variants, such as the K2 Catapult for instance. I also really like how contract negotiations work in this game. As you gain reputation with the factions, more points become available to bargain and increase the contracts uh, in three different areas. Uh, one is kind of pointless though, as it just sort of covers a little bit of your repair costs, but never all of it to make any more money from. Uh, you want to use the other two. These are payment. You increase the base payout for the contract and salvage, which gives you more points to spend, with each point giving you two at the end of the mission. Sometimes, though, you'll be offered salvage you can't afford, because the mission never offered you enough points anyway. So you might get a mech that costs 18 points of salvage, but even if you max out that on the contract, you may only have 14. Which is weird, and it kind of feels like your employer's taking the piss out of you. No, oh, you want that Kintaro? No, it is 18 points, you lack this. But what about the combat? Well, when everything flows, it's solid, and by flow I mean when you and your lance and the enemy AI are crashing around, smashing everything to bits, firing away, it can be quite immersive. The sound design for the most part is pretty good, the new weapon sounds are punchy, they add to the feeling of weight of the machines as they literally stomp through the environment like they were made out of cardboard, and it's also really good to see vehicles and aircraft in the mix with enemy forces attacking and combined arms, keeping you on your toes while you're battling a mech, you'll be hit from the rear and the flanks by tanks and helicopters. I also like the way quests are handled, as they make good use of the incredibly rich Battletech universe, name-dropping famous corporations, units and characters, and some of these can yield unique rewards, and some of the best rewards outside the campaign, like Mech Warriors, Lost Tech, or even complete battle mechs. But honestly, that's where the good stuff ends for me. You see, the combat's great when it does flow, but it doesn't take much to tear you out of it. The AI is at times atrocious for both your lance and your enemies. Things like LRM carriers that drive right into the fray, helicopters that smash into buildings as they fly towards you after spawning in the air, mechs getting stuck on terrain, your lance mates constantly getting their mechs wrecked because they just wander headlong into the fight even when equipped with only long range weapons. Some missions are frustrating with this, like defence missions, which require you to protect all the buildings in a base, but then your lance mates casually stride through the buildings, doing the enemy's work for them. This can actually help you in the opposite mission, in the raid type, where the enemy just plow through their own base to get to you, making your job easier. Seeing enemies pop into existence is funny and odd at the same time. PGI did make some hot fixes after lots to address enemies spawning behind you, but this just created a means for you as a player to basically predict where the next wave will spawn. Just kill the last target and look in the direction you want them to appear and 9 times out of 10 they're going to be there unless the area is blocked, in which it will drop them somewhere near to that location. But if any sense of immersion is to be maintained, it's immediately shattered by this in the downtime between waves during warzone and defence missions. And I mean, it's funny watching spiders running straight at you in your lance of assault mechs, firing its little medium lasers, not making any attempt to avoid you as you fire everything back at them, until they reach their set distance, where they proceed to run around you in a circle until either another player or your friendly lance mate aggros them to someone else or you kill them. Basically every enemy mech does this in one form or another, even the vehicles do. Helicopters get way too close for the weapons they're carrying, especially the uh, the Eagles, the, the VTOL craft with AC2s that decide to hover about 400 meters off the ground and just sit there as big easy targets. The only time I've seen the AI act differently are LRM dependent units like trebuchets or catapults. They kind of back off and try and fire missiles but only with line of sight and they don't use friendly targeting systems to be able to see you. And that's it. The poor AI, the glitchy pathfinding on the procedurally generated maps can create some really poor battles and even your AI pilots are so stupid that if you put them in custom X with just missiles they'll still run into brawling range regardless. PGI have tried to compensate at times by throwing more enemies at you so you don't notice with overwhelming numbers that can appear making battles more of a slog than anything actually approaching fun. The game also lacks mission variety with assassinate, kill X target and run away, warzone, kill X number of enemies and leave the field, defend, kill X number of enemies before they destroy the buildings, 
Raid, destroy buildings, and Demolition, destroy a specific number of buildings. Now, Raid and Demolition might be mixed up in my head, but either way, that is the entire lineup of mission types. And trust me, they get all quick. Missions are over in five minutes, maybe a couple more. They're never going to last you. And even the quests that I, I like the write-up for just use the same missions, but will have unique opening and closing voiceover from your XO. PGI have admitted that there is probably will be adding more mission types, but at the moment it gets old fast. There are also multiple mission contracts, but these are basically just a playlist of the other missions, only you can't repair between the drops, so you need to have multiple lances ready to be sure you have a chance of completing them. I never bothered much beyond a couple of these, since regular one-off missions were faster and I had less repair costs by the end of it. That said, because your AI is so bad, they will always come back with pieces missing from their mechs, and that means repair costs, which can be substantial at times. Until you get to the higher ranks with more points to spend on sea bills for your contract rewards, you'll struggle in the early to mid game without selling equipment to get new mechs, for instance. Travel costs can run into the hundreds of thousands, and combined with days passing and running costs, some trips can run into the millions if you aren't careful. Also, the star map does need a news feed to relay developments across the Inner Sphere, like a major conflict starting, territory changing hands, the creation of entire factions like the Razzlehargs. If you know your Battletech history, you can see it and know what happened and why, but for many, this will just confuse you. Also, modifying mechs is something many will either love or hate in this game. It basically uses a mix of MechWarrior 4's sized hardpoint system and HBS's user interface for a mech lab. So, if you're a fan of being able to mod your mechs like you did in MechWarrior Line, you can't here. You can't modify your engines, you can't choose what weapons goes into a slot either. So, if you had a machine gun, it can only fit small ballistics up to an AC2. No Gauss Rifle fire starters or ER Large Laser Ravens, for example. And this isn't an issue for me personally, but I know some will dislike that approach. My only mech lab gripe personally is the amount of time it takes to replace broken equipment. Having to drag and drop replacement items into the mech after clicking to remove all the broken items is a chore. It would be nice to see a button that replaces the broken equipment with the same item if you have them in your inventory, or just a quick remove for all non-repairable items. Trust me, when you have to replace everything on a stalker because your numbnut AI lance mates lost both side torsos to a pair of mediums, you'll understand pain. And pain. That's the narrative. Maybe I'm looking for too much here, but really, the story is boring, and sadly is lost amidst the grind for rep to unlock the next step of this. Revenge is your driving goal, though it's hard to tell with the dialogue sometimes. It isn't really the fact that it's a revenge story that's a problem, it's the way it's all delivered. You only have three characters that you ever interact with. Rihanna, your XO who is someone I'm guessing your character, Mason's Thundercheeks. I added the Thundercheeks bit. Uh, he has some history with her, but I don't know any of it because I have to have read a novella to know who this person is. Fahad is the same, your company's lead tech. He's a non-walking stereotype of every Londoner you can think of. Every conversation with him has the big British book of slang thrown in there just to hammer the point home that he is a cockney wide boy. Again, I don't know anything about him because I have need to have read a novella. Compared to the crew of the Argo, who all have a backstory you can learn in-game in your own time with their own views on the events of the campaign, flashpoints and other random occurrences, they just feel more realised. The two mannequins here, who never look at you when they speak by the way, are just dull and uninteresting to interact with, as utterly basic as that interaction is. Of course, I can't forget Spears, our resident hologram of exposition. It's cool to see interstellar expeditions represented here, but again, I don't know who this person is, why I should care about him, and I don't learn any more, really, as the story progresses. I want to feel like my Merc company is a family unit. It's emphasised so much in the universe that Mercs are like the crew of, say, the Firefly. Ragtag people from all different backgrounds trying to make their way in a massive galaxy with the odds stacked against them. This game doesn't come close to making me want to connect with the characters. It's not like the voice acting is bad, it's just not that well directed. It's hard to tell if Rihanna's angry, sad, joyful, has wind, wants to go to the beach. All of her lines are delivered in the same BBC radio tone. Informative, yet sterile. Fahad, as I said, is angling for a job on EastEnders, either on the fruit and veg stall or for a job in the pub, and Spears is voiced by the bloke who voiced Ostergaard. So for me, he's Osterhard, and thus is lifting weights, praising the Concordat, and is on the hunt for hot chicks. The opposition isn't any different either, with evil stereotype Barockian Bullwinkle Russian woman and evil Angus McScott of the clan McSinister. 
just two more voices and a very limited cast to evoke no real connection to you as a player. And without spoiling any of the story, the villains are weak, they have no impact, and like your crew, they're forgettable and you feel nothing when you defeat them. They just become another generic mech that you've blasted and moved on to the next. The mercenary company that the bad guys represent, the Black Inferno, is so edgy you could cut yourself on it. It makes some of the battle techs more comical sounding units, more legit somehow. Suffice to say the campaign is unlocked in stages as you gain merc rep and it basically drags you around the inner sphere to unlock new conflict zones to take contracts in. It's also the only way of obtaining some pretty snacky gear, so obviously doing the missions nets you some powerful mechs, like a king crab for instance. Cooperative play is obviously the way the game is intended to be played then, since human players, for the most part, don't make that big of as many mistakes as the AI do. And yes, the game is better for it. Running around on the host dropship, hopping up and down on the spot and throwing yourself off the balconies is kind of funny, and when you can pick uh, what mech you want to pick from the host's lineup, you get to do some stomping. And it works, and it is clearly how the game is meant to be played. The times, however, where it doesn't screw up, it can be fun. If someone can't join your game, you probably have to then close your client, restart the client, send the invites out again. And although some fixes have been made to address this, it can still happen as of the time of writing this review. Also, for anyone who fondly remembers the music of the past MechWarrior games, this isn't anything close to that level. It's a scant album of tracks that become extremely repetitive and fairly bland after the first few hours. Either you hear the same 50 second synth tune repeat endlessly, or you hear some thrash guitar noise that's fairly generic. I can't remember any bespoke tracks for campaign missions, and if they did they just blended in with the others because they aren't that stand out. The game also creates graphic memory leaks, and causes other titles you play to freak out if you don't restart your computer. Extended sessions in MechWarrior 5 does require a restart to make sure that that doesn't happen, at least on my system, and I'm running on an RTX 2070 with about 32GB of RAM and an i7 chip. And though the game hasn't crashed, which is good, and I've played it for around 40-45 to 45 hours, there just seems to be some minor memory leaks in there that, you know, I'm sure PGI will address. So. In closing, would I recommend MechWarrior 5? Not really. Even if it was on Steam right now, I would have a tough time recommending this. The, the, the repetitive nature and limited mission types combined with the same HBS Pokemech gotta catch em all mechanics to artificially inflate playtime makes it dull and a chore. It needs work. We need more varied mission types, they need to improve the AI. We need more of the 3025 era mechs. For some reason the Dervish and Charger fail to make an appearance and they're in MWO right now. I'm sure modding will give the game legs no doubt and I am really interested to see what the mod teams can produce with the template that's been given. The elements are there for a great mech warrior game, but as it is right now, it isn't worth your money. In a year's time, with the planned pay for content additions that have been uh, confirmed by PGI, it will probably add more depth. But really, that just means you'll have a better product come November, December 2020 than what you've been given now in 2019.